Okay, good afternoon, boys and girls, the Brad and the Bradless. My name's Danny Whittaker. This is my own worst enemy, mental health podcast and all that. Um, before we get into the thick of it this week, I think a bit of a apology stroke confession is in order. So uh, some of you may have noticed, been about three, four weeks since I posted the last episode. Uh, that being after I promised to you know, post every, something every week. Uh, and the reason for that is, kind of fell off the wagon recently in these past few weeks. So for me, personally, it's been about, uh, I'd say, nine, ten months or something since I've had any kind of panic attacks or any kind of severe anxiety issues. I mean, get, get me odd off days and stuff, but um, yeah, not to any degree that it's kind of affected my life. I like to think of myself as fully recovered this past year, but yeah, a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, out with the, the family for a, for a meal, and just kind of out of nowhere, I have this kind of panic attack just erupts out of nowhere, and a real bad one as well. I'm not sure if it was, if it, if it just felt that way because it's been so long, but yeah, proper took it out of me. Anyway, I kind of tried to brush it off like, oh, you know, it's fine, just, just, just kind of one of those things. But then, as is the case with these things, I kind of couldn't, couldn't take my eye off the ball then. And then a couple of days later, I had another one. And a couple of days, I had another one. And then I started getting them every day. Uh, and then a couple of times a day. Uh, and, you know, before you know it, I'm in full-blown anxiety mode with the headaches and the dizziness. And I can't get out of bed. And I'm stressing about everything. And I don't want to go anywhere. And, yeah, been a interesting experience. If I'm being completely honest, I've kind of felt it coming for a while, I think. When I say it was out of the blue, I don't think that's entirely true. I've kind of been stressed out a little bit recently. Got a lot kind of going on in life. Uh, you know, I had a, a close family member. I had a, um, I had a brain image recently and then found out I'm going to be a dad for the second time. And also, I think one of the things that's kind of been stressing me has been this project. Because even though it, it started out as something that I was just kind of going to do in my spare time as a bit of a hobby and just occasionally it's 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 kind of taken off for me and I thought well you know I'm going to throw myself into it and 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 kind of see what comes of it but I've not been able to throw myself into it in any kind of relaxed and joyful way I've as usual with many things I've been very perfectionistic about it and kind of taking it way too seriously so for instance uh, you probably haven't noticed, <laughs> but I'd the like the intros to these podcasts about you know anything from five to ten minutes long, and instead of just allowing myself to just sit down in front of the mic and just chat away like I'm doing now, trying to practice this non-editing, non-perfectionistic side, um, I really kind of stressed out about it. So instead of just being able to riff five or ten minutes just speaking off the cuff, I wrote everything down, everything was scripted, and you know, it'd take me a couple of hours to do that, because, you know, that has to be right, and that has to be perfect, and then when it came to recording it, a yeah, five minute intro could take me like, two, three, four hours, because, I'd be doing take, after take, after take, after take, trying to get it right, and then, when I finally, got a take, that I do actually like, even then I'm putting it into the computer, and I'm trying to, edit that and make it perfect as well. Maybe I said the, the odd um and, you know, um and ah in and maybe a pause too long and just really kind of stressing myself out about it. And it was getting to the point where uh, I kind of wasn't really enjoying it, if I'm honest. It was, every episode was, uh, even though I love doing the interviews, the interviews are amazing, the the actual editing process and the, the getting them posted on the internet, that was kind of really getting to me. And... The thing is, for me, I, I really, I really do want this to be like a professional, professionally presented podcast, and you know, because of the subject matter and that, I think that's that, that's kind of important. But at the same time, I need to make it sustainable and I need to make it kind of enjoyable for myself. So, I think kind of moving forwards, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try and relax a little bit, be a, be a bit, bit more myself and. 
not try to worry about editing things so perfectly and not writing everything out and just kind of uh, go off the cuff. So in, in the, the interview that I do today, this was kind of the last interview that I was uh, being perfectionistic about and, and writing out all the questions and, and researching my ass off the week before and really kind of getting stressed out about it. The, the, the next episode we've got coming up, which is on a panic disorder and anxiety and agoraphobia, funnily enough. Um, that's the first time I've kind of just, instead of sitting down and writing all the, the questions out and, and, and being just overly perfectionistic about it, I just kind of sat down with some questions in mind and just had a chat with the person I was talking to. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm going to do moving forwards. So these intros and the interviews themselves might be a little less professional, a little less, well, not less professional, but a little less structured, a little less linear, more conversational, and you'll just have to put with a bit more umming and ahhing, I'm afraid. So, yeah, anyway, that's that. And, oh, I'm on I'm kind of on the mend as well, just in case you were worried. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm doing all right. I've kind of, I think one of the things was, uh, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more in detail in in, in in like a future episode. One of the traps I fall into is when I'm not feeling great and my anxiety is up, I'll, I, I like go gung ho with it. So, you know, I'll do the meditation, I start eating better and I'm kind of on it with my diet and exercising and trying to, you know, get out there in the world and, and you know, be an active member of society and all that. But then when I start to feel better, that's when I get lazy because it's a bit like, oh, well, I'm all right now. So, you know, bollocks to all that stuff. And I stop meditating and I stop exercising and I stop eating so well. And, uh, and you know, that's that's kind of exactly what I've been doing the past few months. I've been, you know, eating like shit and not exercising, not meditating, not bothering to... No, my sleep is another thing. I think it's important to, to really be on it with, like, your, your, your sleep hygiene. Uh, and I've j I really let that go to pop recently. So that, that hasn't helped. And... Yeah, this past week or so, got back on it, I'm exercising, I'm eating better, yada yada yada, and you know, lo and behold, I'm feeling a lot better. So, yeah, anyway, let's see, see how this goes, and uh, there we go, seven minutes in, not too bad, and I'm not editing this one either. So, anyway, today's episode, we're talking about social anxiety disorder. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Emma Warnock-Parks. She's a clinical psychologist, an accredited CBT therapist, and a senior research fellow in the Experimental Psychology Department at the University of Oxford and King's College London, uh, where she works alongside professors David Clark and Anka Ellers, developing the models and treatments for PTSD, that's uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and social anxiety disorder. In addition to working as a trial therapist, carrying out research and supervising students, she also lectures at a number of universities across the UK. So today we explore what the difference is between social anxiety disorder and say plain old shyness and introversion, uh, whether people are really judging us and staring at us or whether it's all just in our heads. Uh, more to the point, why do we even care? Like what's the evolutionary purpose of social anxiety? Uh, we talk about the irrational thoughts that drive the disorder uh, people's avoidance behaviours and how it comes to affect people's lives. And most importantly, what can we do to overcome it? So you can follow Emma on Twitter. She's at Emma W Parks. That's at E-M-M-A-W-P-A-R-K-E-S. And as I always say, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Emma Warnock Parks. Okay, Emma, welcome to the podcast. It's been Hi. a bit of a long time in the making, this one. We finally got there in the end. My first question to you before we get into the thick of it, I like, like to ask everybody this, is how and why did you end up in, in this particular field of study? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, well, I, I started specialising in, in anxiety disorders a number of years ago. Um, I think 
anxiety is so much a part of being human, isn't it? It's something we all experience. And it's something that many people in my family experienced, including myself. And so I just became very interested in anxiety and social anxiety in particular. Social anxiety disorder is the most common anxiety disorder there is. It affects a huge number of people. And so I think it's incredibly important that we devote um, careful time and attention to researching it. And, um, you know, a number of years ago, I started working at the Centre for Anxiety Disorders and Trauma in London and started working with some fabulous um, people who were suffering with social anxiety. And I learned so much from those people um, and just really sort of thoroughly enjoyed working with them really and, and realised the power of effective treatment for this problem. It's an incredibly debilitating problem, but the treatments can be incredibly powerful in helping people kind of really flourish and move on with their lives. And so I decided that social anxiety was really a sort of a passion for me, really, and something that I wanted to continue sort of working in and, and helping develop the treatments so more and more people can get access to them. Yeah, I think just to just to kind of put it into into some context, even though we'll, we'll kind of get to the, the, the percentages and stuff, the 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 mental health support group that I run, uh-huh. uh, I, I'd say that people with social anxiety probably account for maybe fifty sixty percent of the entire membership. That's their reason for turning up to to this particular support group, which I found, or I still find quite quite surprising to be honest. It's one of them things that you think you te- maybe it's just a symptom of social anxiety that you think you've got it, everybody else is fine, but that really doesn't seem to be the case. Like you say, it is. A, a massive problem the thing is, when we say when we're talking about social anxiety though i think it's it, it's important to kind of define it properly so what would be what would you say the difference is the difference between social anxiety and just plain shyness or introversion yeah yeah it's a good question well i mean to start with social anxiety itself if we're not thinking about social anxiety disorder, as I said, is a very common part of human experience. You know, we all experience some level of social anxiety in some situations in our lives. It's something that really is on a continuum, if you like, and people at the very far extreme of that continuum will experience very extreme anxiety that will be debilitating and and impact on their life day to day. And and there we would see really a very persistent fear of social situations that's very much characterised by a fear of sort of doing or saying something that would cause that person embarrassment or humiliation and potential rejection from other people. Um, And as I said, it can have a huge impact on people's lives at that end of the continuum. But it's something, social anxiety itself is an experience that we will all identify with. You know, we all have had experience of feeling anxious on a job interview or a first date, for example, or giving a presentation. But when we're thinking about social anxiety disorder, that's where we're thinking about the kind of um, very debilitating um, impact of a sort of ang- a persistent anxiety um, in social situations. Now, shyness, it's interesting you, you sort of mentioned what the difference between shyness and social anxiety disorder is. Shyness is, is very common. Lots of people describe themselves as being shy. I think um, studies in sort of college students have shown 50 to 60 percent of people will of college students will say they see themselves as a shy person. But not all people will see their shyness as having a negative impact on their life. So you can be shy, for example, and not um, necessarily have social anxiety disorder. Um, many people, as I said, will say, well, I'm shy, but it doesn't doesn't necessarily get in the way of my life or sort of stop me from doing things. So again, it's a sort of on a continuum, if you like. Um, and then you mentioned introversion, which is also slightly different because many people will describe themselves as being introverted. But introverted people tend to actually just prefer their own time. They tend to prefer being engaged in solitary activities. Um, it's not necessarily that they're, it, it, people may often sort of misinterpret that as they're being very shy or socially anxious. But actually, they may just like engaging in solitary activities and prefer not to socialise as much as other people. So I I don't know if I've I've helped in pulling that apart a little bit, but it is a bit of a confusing field because I think people use these terms very interchangeably, but they they mean quite different things. No, no, that's that's perfect. I think as far as, far as your study is concerned, that, that that you guys do at Oxford, is that dealing yeah. with purely social anxiety as a disorder, or is it? It is. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the people we tend to see, so we run a number of clinical research trials where we're treating people um, as part of research, really. We're looking at how effective the treatments are for social anxiety disorder. And we tend to kind of, the people who come into our treatment studies, we tend to um, assess them fully. So they tend to have a diagnosis of social anxiety disorder. And for example, on a number of kind of questionnaire measures, they would be scoring very highly on those measures over and above uh, what you would see somebody else scoring in the in the sort of general population. Okay, well, yeah, actually, I'd like to um, kind of cover that now if we can, because I think it ties in. What is the actual process of diagnosing somebody with social anxiety disorder? It, kind of what are the parameters within which it exists? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and many people don't agree with di- psychiatric diagnosis, as I'm, I'm sure you know, it, it can be a bit of a controversial topic. I mean, when, when we're, t- we're talking about diagnosis for social anxiety disorder, there are um, certain kind of guidelines that we use to sort of tell whether somebody would meet diagnostic criteria for social anxiety. And, and, and we would use those really. So it would be a, you'd be doing a sort of clinical interview with somebody, um, assessing the kind of, um, the descriptors they describe of their problem, um, looking at, um, whether or not what they're describing would, would meet the, um, diagnostic criteria really that have been outlined, um, for social anxiety disorder. Um, is the, which, sorry, is the, is the, is the kind of a, a standardized test, like with depression, people use the Beck depression checklist and. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's um, the ADIS, which is um, Anxiety Disorders a Structured Clinical Interview that we would use. Um, and there are a number of um, sort of questionnaire measures. We wouldn't necessarily use those to, to determine whether somebody had a diagnosis, but they would certainly give us some information as to the sort of level of impairment and distress that someone was experiencing. So, it, you know, there are a number of measures um one of the measures that we use and, and lots of researchers use is the Leibovitz social anxiety scale, for example. Um, but again, that's just used to give us a bit more information as to the level of someone's social anxiety when they're, they're coming in for an assessment. How do you manage to get your hands on these people? And what I mean by that is with, say, with depression or anxiety, it, it's common for people's first part of call to be the doctor. You go see your GP about that. But... I can't. I might be wrong here, but I can't imagine that when somebody feels socially anxious, that feels like something to go to the doctor about, and yeah. in order to you know get a referral for for treatment. So, like, how do you how do you guys get hold of these people to to help them? Yeah, you, I mean, you've touched on a number of important issues there. I think, Danny. I mean, we know that social anxiety typically starts quite early in someone's life. So, you know, not always, but on average we're seeing social anxiety start in someone's adolescence around the age of 13 often. But people often don't come into treatment for for many, many years. So on average, we see people when they come for treatment in their early 30s, and and often those people have never had any treatment previously. So they've suffered for a really long time without getting help. And I think you were touching on some issues there that may be related to that. So, you know, often people don't necessarily realise that the, the problem that they have uh, has a name and an effective treatment. Um, they've suffered with it for so long that they might just see it as part of themselves. Um, uh, sometimes going to your GP is quite daunting if you're struggling with social anxiety. Um, people often see GPs as a sort of authority figure that can be, you know, quite intimidating to kind of go and talk about your difficulties. And so that can often be a bit of a barrier for treatment. So in answer to your question, where do we get referrals from? Well, sometimes people have been brave enough to go to their GP. Um, Often um, nowadays, there are lots of services, um, IAPT services, so improving access to psychological therapy services, and people can actually self-refer. They can refer themselves without needing to go through their GP. And they can often refer themselves online. So that can can be a bit of an easier route sometimes for someone with social anxiety to to reach out and refer themselves um, in in to get treatment to get help and in our clinical trials we're not running any at the moment but when we have run them we tend to take referrals from local um, IAPT services so the improving access to psychological therapy services so we get people coming through that way and sometimes also just from visiting our website uh, we might sort of mention that we're running a, a treatment trial and sometimes people will contact us that way and so uh, we might sort of get some people coming for to take part in the trials through that route as well 
Okay, just out of interest, is there is there like a, a standard website that people can go to for this self referral? Because I've not heard of that before. I didn't know you could do that. So yeah, so if um, if someone would you were to look at the NHS Choices website, um, and and then there is actually a link on there where they can find their local IAPT service. So for example, um, I'm just on NHS Choices now, having literally just Googled um, IAPT services and, and that link came up. And now I'm just putting in uh, my location. So if I put in my postcode, let's see what comes up. Um, here we go. So if I put my postcode in now, what will come up are the sort of local IAP services for me. And then I can, on that website, it gives me the option to click here for access to a self-referral form. So I can click and get a link where I complete an online form or, or make a phone call to somebody or just email the service um, and ask about getting um, referred. So that it might take a little bit of hunting around um, online, but if somebody was to look at NHS choices and to look up improving access to psychological therapies or IAPT, I-A-P-T, they should be able to find their local service and self-refer. Okay, perfect. I think it's definitely definitely worth mentioning because it hasn't hasn't come up before. And like I say, I didn't know you could do that. So another thing you mentioned I mean, a moment ago was that people with social anxiety it tends, it tends to present during adolescence as, as first onset. So if we could just kind of do a, a, a basic epidemiology I can tell you as much as I know. So um, I know that um, we tend to think of social anxiety as being the most common anxiety disorder. So a very large US study found a, around 12% of people will have had social anxiety disorder at some point in their lives, which is actually a huge number um, compared to a number of other um, a number of other anxiety disorders. Um, it's very very common. Um, we tend to, what's interesting about social anxiety disorder, actually, Danny, is that um, when we account for other demographic variables like age and race and income and education, there actually isn't a significant difference between the number of men and women that experience it. And that's quite rare. So normally with most of the anxiety disorders, for example, you would see a much higher prevalence in women but you don't see such a big difference in social anxiety disorder. So it tends to affect men and women roughly equally. Um, so that's quite that's quite uncommon. Um, and as I said before, um, it's a problem that typically starts in adolescence. And sadly, what we know is that it can be quite chronic if people don't get the right kind of help. And so um, we tend to see sort of it kind of being quite a lasting problem for people and, until they get the help that they need really. Right, okay, so for the lucky, what was it, 88% of people that don't suffer with social anxiety, I think it'd be interesting to kind of explore what it looks like both from the inside and from the outside. So if we start with kind of, we start with like the cognitive processes of it, the, the psychology of it, what are the, what are the, the, a lot of the beliefs and assumptions, misconceptions that kind of trigger and, and, and fuel social anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. So it, what we tend to see um, with people who are experiencing social anxiety disorder are lots of very negative thoughts and images about how they're coming across in social situations. So, you know, what we typically find is that people um, experiencing social anxiety disorder often have very high standards for their social performance. So they might have various assumptions, for example, about social situations. For, and, and these can vary person to person, but some examples might be, I have to be witty and interesting all the time or I'll be rejected or I cannot show any signs of my anxiety, or people will think I'm weak, they won't want to know me. Um, as I said before as well, people often have very kind of negative images in their mind or pictures or impressions of how they're coming across socially. So for example, people might in their head see themselves as looking very anxious, looking very red in the face, for example, um, uh, very sweaty, Whereas actually they're, they're not necessarily coming across like that. So the image and impression that you might have in your mind might be quite distorted to what other people see. So you're seeing yourself as looking very kind of negative in a social situation. And you might have associated thoughts about your performance socially. So thinking that you're coming across as quite boring, for example, or you're saying something stupid 
or you're showing signs of anxiety, like you're shaking or you're blushing and you would worry that people would judge or re- those signs or, or reject you because of those things. People with social anxiety may also have sort of quite unconditional beliefs about themselves, so seeing themselves as unlikable or not good enough, for example, as well. So we tend to see it generally being characterised by having lots of kind of negative thoughts and images about how you're coming across in social situations, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's it kind of sounds, when you kind of refer into the like the cognitive distortions, it sounds like quite a lot of mind readings going on. So not so you putting yourself in the you know the person in front of you, you're putting yourself inside their mind and making assumptions about what they're thinking about you. Yeah, you're spot on there, Danny. And actually, what we know is that people um, with social anxiety often have uh, an image of themselves from the observer's perspective, if that makes sense. So they're almost sort of seeing a picture of themselves as they imagine they're coming across to other people. And I, I think you, you, the word mind reading is quite interesting there. We, we tend to think of social anxiety being very characterized by a lot of self-criticism, that people are constantly monitoring themselves and evaluating themselves negative, negatively. And then almost, if you like, projecting those thoughts into the minds of others. So assuming because they're thinking that way about themselves, that other people must be too. Do we know why do we know why we care about that in the first place? So when we're entering into a social situation and worrying, you know, what we look like and what people are thinking of us, why why does that matter? And what's the kind of what's the, what's the purpose of self consciousness in that sense? Do we know? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, I think as as you you've, you've sort of hit the nail on the head there, and that we all do a bit of this. You know, as human beings, we all care a bit what other people think of us. And there are some evolutionary theories that will say, well, actually, this is it's very important to care what other people think of you. Um, to some degree, um, we're social animals and what our social group would think of us could could be a matter of survival to some degree. You know, if you're liked and accepted by your social group, you're more likely to survive than if you were rejected by your social group. And so evolutionary ideas may say, may say, well, you know, caring what other people think is is very important in general. And so this is why why we do it. And we all experience some level of, of self-consciousness. Um, as I said, this is very much on a continuum. Um, we all do, do this a little bit. Um, but it, when we're thinking about social anxiety disorder, this is where this overthinking how you're coming across is just getting too much people are very much in their heads if you like constantly evaluating and monitoring how they're coming across and actually that's not helpful um that's um going to hinder your yourself socially that's going to sort of fuel your social anxiety and so yes some of this you could see as um, developing in a very evolutionary way it makes sense but in social anxiety it's really become too much if you like so when people are, um, it, it seems there's kind of a, there tends to be like a negative expectation. So if we take, for example, going out to the, to, to the pub mm-hmm. and so in the hours leading up to it, someone with social anxiety would be worrying about what's going to happen. So imagining scenarios and, and, and worrying about that. Then when they get to the pub, they would be analyzing or trying to analyze what people are thinking and trying to pick up on social cues and feeling judged in that sense so kind of seeing the negative in the present tense does the same thing happen retrospectively as well so when the person's gone home from the pub will they then look back on the situation and remember it as as being that was the night you know that night i went out to the pub i was being judged and it went terribly does that happen as well Yes, for many people, sadly, it does. Um, And we call that post-event rumination, um, or or we almost describe it as a bit of a social post-mortem, if you like, where people are kind of going over and over and over the details of something they said or something they did or how somebody reacted in a given situation. And that can be a very painful process that can lead people to feel not only very anxious, but quite low in mood as well. I mean, I I was talking to a a young person I'm working with the other day and and she was describing how she will almost do this for years sometimes. So if she feels something didn't go well, she will go over and over and over that. And it could go on for years almost. She will not be able to quite let go of the shame around something she thinks that she did that didn't go very well, for example. And so it can be a very torturous process for people. 
and something that we work on in therapy with people to help them overcome. Yeah, the, the reason I ask that is because uh, I'm interested in the, the, the comorbidity of, of social anxiety with, with other disorders because that, and I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily true, but this idea that anxiety is worrying about the future and depression is being focused on the past. But with social anxiety, you, you get both. So I'm just wondering what are other conditions that tend to be comorbid with, with social anxiety? Yeah, you've made a very good observation, Danny. Um, social anxiety has lots of comorbidity um, with uh, other anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety, for example, but also depression. And I think you really hit the nail on the head there where you were describing um, that dwelling that people can often do on, on things that they haven't thought have gone well and the impact that that can have on their mood. So, you know, lots of people I've worked with with social anxiety will also experience periods of low mood um, that may be in part related to kind of going over and over things that they think that they haven't done well and being very hard on themselves, very self-critical. But it may also be related to the impact social anxiety disorders had on their life. For example, um, they may not have managed to have the kind of relationships that they would like to because social anxiety disorders got in the way. They may not have achieved what they wanted to in their their academic life or their um, their career because again, social anxiety disorder has held them back. And that in turn can lead to very self-critical thinking and, and low mood and depression sometimes. So yes, we often see sadly social anxiety disorder and depression go hand in hand. And I think sometimes often um, we know that uh, GPs don't always necessarily pick up on social anxiety disorder very well. And I think that may be because often there are other things that mask it. So people may be presenting as very depressed in mood or maybe even drinking or using drugs to manage their anxiety. And, and those kinds of things are, are often picked up much more easily than the underlying social anxiety, I think. The other thing is looking at it from the inside is apart from the, the cognitive process, what people are thinking, what do people tend to feel? And what are the, is there any physical symptoms involved in it? Yes. I mean, you know, I'm sure you can imagine times yourself where you felt anxious. You know, we all experience different bodily sensations when we feel anxious. And that, those will vary person to person. Um, but people often describe their heart racing, for example, feeling very tense, feeling hot and sweaty. Um, again, a variety of uh, physical manifestations that can vary person to person. But yes, lots of uh, physiological sensations come. Yeah, I imagine things like sweating and, and blushing especially i imagine they can become like a vicious cycle then because as you know you can you turn up and you feel like oh god i'm, I'm sweating now and now people are really thinking about me and people can smell me or especially blushing is that blushing's the worst i mean i've luckily i'm i'm kind of i don't know i think as you get older you, you just, like care a bit less and stuff but yeah in my younger days i could go purple with embarrassment and then that's just that, I mean, that really does feel humiliating. And like I say, it kind of becomes like a, a vicious cycle then. What, what I think is interesting about that, though, is I think I've read somewhere that the purpose of blushing is to, like we were saying before about this, this evolutionary perspective, it's, kind of, it's, it's a, a physical manifestation of showing the outside world your internal state. So by blushing, you're showing yourself as being submissive and almost like knowing your place in the in the hierarchy i think that's also why women um, traditionally wear blusher isn't it it kind of looks submissive and therefore it's supposed to be attractive but i think it's it's there's kind of an irony there that the the thing that's supposed to help you you know i blush and then that helps me it helps everyone see you know i'm not i'm quite introverted and i'm um you know i'm not a threat to anybody all that does is is mesh you up internally even more and make you feel even even worse about yourself. Well, I think what what's interesting that you've you've said there is that you blush, so do I, so does everyone actually. You know, blushing, sweating, all these things are part of being human. You know, none of us can avoid blushing or sweating. Um, so these are very much um, physiological reactions that none of us can control. Now, what, what interested me as well is that you mentioned that you used to sort of blush and feel as if you were kind of purple in the face. Uh, 
Now, this is a very common thing I hear um, from, from lots of people I work with is that they have a sort of image in their mind of how they think they look when they blush or they sweat, for example. Now, what we know from um, from treating people and, and researching with people with social anxiety is that people tend to have a much more negative image in their head about how they look compared to how actually they come across to other people. And so people may have the sort of sensation of blushing and sort of have an image in their mind that they look sort of purple or, or beetroot red is another thing I, I hear a lot from people. And actually, when we look at video um, of how people come across when they're blushing and how they actually look, they don't look nearly as red as they think. And so they're overestimating um, how they think they look based on their feelings. Because as I mentioned before, when we're feeling socially anxious, we become very self-conscious. So when you feel you're blushing, all you focus in on is your cheeks. And it can give you the kind of illusion in your mind, if you like, that you look much redder than you actually do. And the same with sweating. You know, when we feel we're sweating, we focus in on, on our armpits or our hands or wherever we feel the sweat is. And again, that can give us the sort of impression that we look and we're coming across much sweatier than we actually are. And again, when we've shown people video of how they look when they're feeling very sweaty, for example, again, you don't sort of notice nearly as much sweat as you feel. And so again, these images we have of ourselves when we're socially anxious are very distorted. How we think we look is, is often much worse than how we actually come across. And these things, nine times out of 10, aren't even noticeable to other people, but they're very noticeable to us because we're very in our head and we're very focused on these sensations. And we're using these sensations as a guide to how we think we look. Does that make sense? It does. And what it reminds me of uh, I think one of the, one of the things that I found a piece of advice, if you can call it that, that I heard, which kind of helped me with any kind of social anxiety, was I don't know if this is true. Whether you'd agree with this, but that social anxiety, in a way, is the most egocentric of of the anxieties because it's this idea that when you walk into a room, all heads turn round to you, and that you're the centre of attention. And the way he put it was that we make the mistake of thinking that we're the star in everybody else's movie. But the truth is, you're just a supporting cast member because this, in the same way that you're walking into a room worrying what everyone's thinking of you, everybody else is kind of doing the same. Everybody else is self-conscious as well. I don't know if you think that, if, if there's any truth in that, but... I think that's a really interesting point you've made. And I think you've touched on something um, that we talk a lot with people we work with about, which is when you're feeling very self-conscious, you tend to be very focused on, on yourself. What you're doing essentially is staring at yourself very closely. And that will give you the illusion that everyone around you is staring at you too. And so what we tend to find is that often if we're working with somebody who's socially anxious, if they walk into, for example, a busy lecture theatre, if they're at university or a busy waiting room, they're watching themselves very closely. And this is giving them the illusion that everybody is zooming in on them. And, and one of the things that we do with people in treatment, actually, is we often um, we do something called the staring behavioral experiment with people where we go out with them for a walk into a busy area and we get people to look down and bring on the feeling that other people are staring at them by staring at themselves a bit. And then we get them to look up and actually observe what are other people focused on? What are other people doing? And this is often a, a, a sort of really fascinating experiment for people because people can learn that when they actually look up they, and observe other people, they realise that other people are kind of lost in their own worlds. They're busy on their mobile phone or they're sort of uh, busy doing something else. And actually that this feeling of being stared at is a bit of an illusion because actually it's you staring at yourself. Yeah. Um, if, if we could kind of move on to some of the the behavioural aspects of it. So I read this somewhere, I can't remember where it was, that social anxiety is um, an illness of missed opportunities, which I think is quite a, seems quite a, an apt way of, of putting it. What will people tend to do? Mm. I, know, I know it's easy to say, well, people will avoid situations, but does it go, does it kind of go any deeper than that? Yes, yeah, so I mean, avoidance is a, a big problem that you've mentioned there already. Um, it does go deeper than avoidance. Um, people people will use 
a range of what we call safety seeking behaviors and what we mean by that are strategies that people have understandably developed because they've got very scary fears and concerns they've developed these concern these these strategies to try and help themselves but unfortunately often they have unintended consequences so if could i give you maybe a couple of examples that might help that come alive yeah, of course, um, for example, you know, somebody I was working with was very, very concerned that they came across as boring to other people. And so because of that, she developed a, a range of strategies. Um, one example was that she would constantly prepare interesting topics to talk about. So she would wake up in the morning and read interesting topics in the news and make some notes of interesting things that she could bring into conversation. And during conversations, she would constantly be thinking what can I introduce into this conversation that would be interesting and, and monitoring herself for what am I coming across as boring? How interesting do I sound? Now, unfortunately, this has some negative consequences because it means that she's never really in the conversation with the other person. She's constantly thinking about what she's going to say. And also she's never really being herself in the conversation. She's never people are never really discovering who she really is. And also, it means that often she misses bits of conversations with people and the conversation's moved on because she's constantly thinking about something else she's going to say. And so th these kinds of safety behaviours will vary um, person to person related to their very specific concerns. So, for example, somebody who worries about blushing would have very different behaviours to that. They might, when they sort of, um, when they feel they're blushing, look away or hide their face, for example, or wear um, lots of makeup to try and cover a potential blush. Um, but the impact of these behaviours often, unintended impact, is that often they can make people feel much more self-conscious, because again, you're, you're much more in your own head when you're doing these, these strategies. They can also really prevent people from discovering who you are, and so they can prevent you from sort of really building deep and meaningful relationships with other people around you. And I think that is a very sad thing about social anxiety is that everybody I've worked with who struggled with social anxiety are really wonderful people. You know, these are fun, funny people, interesting people who feel so negatively about their, how they're coming across that they hide themselves. And I think the wonderful thing about seeing somebody through treatment is that at the end of treatment, you're able to see someone being themselves much more. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering as well, you saying that, do, do people with social anxiety tend to, when they're in social situations, do they tend to lie a lot as well to kind of construct uh, a, a protective persona? Um, well... I, I'm not sure I'd use that word. I mean, some people can. A very common concern is um, a fear of disagreeing with other people, for example. So this is something I come across a lot. So worries about um, saying something that might offend somebody else or saying something to disagree with somebody in case you, you upset the other person. And so that can mean that the, the person with social anxiety often doesn't share their opinions as much. So for example, um, if you and I were talking about films we enjoyed and um, I, I was very worried about disagreeing with you, I, I might say that I liked a film that you liked even if I didn't like it, for example. And so in that respect, um, people, again, it, it's, it's not lying as much, it's more hiding your true self, it's hiding your true opinions and your true thoughts for fear of being judged by the other person. And so again, the other person isn't really getting to know you. And, and that can have a very a big impact on your ability to kind of form close relationships with other people. You know, in order to kind of feel bonds with other people, people need to know us, don't they? They need to know who we are um, and we need to feel comfortable sharing ourselves with other people. And truly, that's the only way to feel accepted by other people is to be yourself. Yeah. But these, these strategies can really get in the way of that. And, and, and that's very difficult for many people. Just before we, we move on, uh, one thing I forgot to ask was, what are the, the most common situations that people become fearful of? Again, that can vary from person to person. I mean, the, the, the kind of the nation's biggest fear is public speaking. <laughs> and I think that would probably um, hold for most of the people I've worked with with social anxiety disorder as well. So um, any situation where your centre of attention and you're having to speak up in front of other people will be a very common 
feared concern. So giving a presentation, giving a report to a group of people, for example. But again, this can vary quite a bit from person to person. So often we might see people who worry a lot about meeting strangers, meeting new people, um, dating, um, sort of speaking on the telephone. Um, it could be a very a wide range of things like taking something back to a shop for example um as i mentioned disagreeing with people can be something people worry about a lot um group situations parties uh interviews a real range and and this will vary from person to person as to the kinds of situations that some people worry about more than others i think that's a it's a good segue into uh, something we kind of uh, touched on when we uh, spoke on the phone a couple of months ago was I vaguely remember you mentioning that tr social anxiety can transfer into the online world as well. So people will feel socially anxious on Facebook and, and the like. So can you go, go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is something I became very interested in. We did some studies um, with um, patients that we were treating and also, also um, students that had high and low levels of social anxiety. And what we found is that um, people who have high levels of social anxiety and social anxiety disorder tend to have exactly the same kinds of concerns that they would have face to face in their online world. So, for example, if you tend to worry that you don't have anything interesting to say when you're face to face with people, you tend to have the same worry about Facebook. So then people might use particular online strategies like not adding very much to Facebook, being more of a passive user rather than sort of adding posts, for example, or just overthinking the posts that they're adding. So spending a lot of time preparing what they're going to add rather than just adding something without thinking about it. Um, and, and that's what we tended to, tended to find. Um, I think it, I think that's quite sad in a way because it just goes to show that you're never completely free of your social anxiety, even when other people aren't physically present. And I do think that the online world potentially has a lot of could have a lot of benefits for people with social anxiety. You know, it could could provide the means to start to build deeper relationships with people in a graded way. If only people were able to kind of let go of some of their safety behaviours online and to start to kind of be themselves a little bit more, I think. One thing I hear kind of mentioned a lot, just in a very kind of bro science, pseudo sciencey way at the at the support group is, a lot of people seem to think that social media is something that fuels social anxiety in the sense that things like Facebook and Instagram, it's where people present their, like an edited version of their life. So, you know, the, the most average guy in the world can make himself look like a rock star on Facebook. <laughs> and then- yeah, <laughs> and then when you're you're sat at home flick it, looking at all your your friends and stuff and they look like they're having amazing lives and you're like oh god i'm just kind of sat here in my pajamas watching netflix that that can make you feel bad about yourself and then make you feel even less of a person when you actually do go out into to, to social situations do you think there's something in that I think it's a very interesting point you've just made and and you know what what you don't realize at that moment is that everyone else is also sitting in their pajamas watching Netflix yeah. just not posting pictures of that on Facebook I mean I think you make a very good point Danny I mean in our study we found that people with social anxiety higher social anxiety tended to compare themselves much more on Facebook than to others than people with lower social anxiety and I think that can have a negative impact um on how you feel about yourself, your social anxiety and, and your self-esteem. And there've been other studies looking at the impact of social media on self-esteem. But I think, again, it's all about how you use it. So, you know, if you keep in mind when you're looking at Facebook that other people, again, are just presenting the best version of themselves, they're not on holiday 365 days a year, for example, they probably are most evenings sitting in their pajamas watching Netflix, um, doing not particularly interesting things. I think you, if you keep that in mind, um, then it probably isn't going to um, negatively affect you as much. But if you are lo doing lots of comparing yourself to other people on Facebook and only kind of taking at face value what people are putting on Facebook, then it could potentially have a negative impact on how you feel. I think it is just about using Facebook carefully and, and remembering that 
everybody does a bit of what we call impression management online. And in fact, actually, our research showed that, that it, people with low social anxiety d did a lot of these things as well. So, you know, they were also thinking quite carefully about what they say on Facebook and were censoring a lot of what they put on Facebook. So it just goes to show that we all do a bit of that. And, and people aren't, don't show really their true, complete, honest selves on Facebook. Otherwise, most of my Facebook profile would be pictures of me in my pajamas watching Netflix. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it isn't. It's mostly me on holiday. <laughs> right. If we could kind of move on to some of the, the causes now. I'm not even sure if, that, if, if that's the right word or just things that kind of make you susceptible to social anxiety. So you say that it, the age of onset tends to be in, in adolescence. Is there any kind of main reasons for that? Any, any, is there any kind of, tend to be any kind of triggering events or anything like that? I mean, again, there's no definitive answer I can, I can give you to that, but I can, I can talk to a few theories around that. I mean, we know that adolescence is a, is a tricky time for lots of people. Um, you often may be changing schools. Um, you've got a, a peer group around you. Um, of young people who are still forming their personalities, some of whom can, a lot of teasing, for example, and things like that can, can go on in adolescence. So it can be um, a particularly tricky time uh, for young people, potentially particularly young people who are more, of more of a shy temperament, for example. Um, again, we don't have any sort of clear definitive answers. We never do in psychological research about the causes of any mental health problem. Um, you know, there are some theories um, that sort of talk about the role of, of genetics and things like that. Uh, we know, for example, that um, if your parent has an anxiety disorder, you're more likely to have an, an, a problem with anxiety yourself. But we don't know enough about whether that, that's related to genetic uh, factors or environmental factors. What we do know um, in the cognitive model of social anxiety, uh, we've, we know that people, um, as I mentioned before, have very negative um, self-images about how they come across. And the research that we've done has found that Typically, those images um, li link to early socially traumatic events that often are around the onset of someone's social anxiety disorder. So, you know, for example, a study was done um, in our group that looked at um, people's early social traumatic events, for example, bullying, teasing, a lot of criticism from, from a parent, for example. And we found that, that they tended to very much relate to someone's negative impression of how they look. If I give you an example, um, a, a young person um, I was working with a number of years ago um, was put on the spot um, in her class and, and asked to do something um, in front of a lot of other people. And she felt like she blushed very red at the time. And a number of people started laughing in the group um, and sort of told her she looked ridiculous. And Ever since then, she had a very kind of uh, negative image of herself looking very red and looking very ridiculous whenever she spoke up in front of a group of people. And that sort of image haunted her, if you like, a bit like a ghost from the past haunting her in the present. And our theory was that this was quite key in the development of her social anxiety. But again, I can't give you a definitive you know, this is the cause of social anxiety. That's just one of the kind of theories, if you like, that early social trauma may in part be related to the development of social anxiety. I think I've, I've read something about the, the kind of cultural differences might have, have something to answer for as well. So for instance, uh, in the West, it tends to be that we value we value people that are extroverted and to be introverted and shy, that's, that's kind of a bad thing. Whereas it seems to be, and it, you know, these are generalizations, but in the East China, Japan to be, to be, to be quieter, and more introverted, that's more hi highly valued and you're seen as more trustworthy. What do you think about that? Do you think maybe, I don't know, polit politically or culturally, we might have something to answer for as well? It's certainly possible. Um, I know that I've read some similar theories myself, and there are some cultural differences in the rates of social anxiety um, in different different countries. Oh, um, do you, sorry. Do you know what what they are? Just generally, are in my head, no. I'd have to look up look up the studies. Um, but I, I do know that the the rates, for example, I think in in countries like Korea, are, tend to be much lower. Um, 
But again, it's very hard when we're looking at these studies to sort of definitively know why that is. I mean, it may also be related to the way in which um, diag- problems are diagnosed in these different studies um, and some of the kind of measures that are used um, in these different studies also um, aren't often, they're not often all standardized measures. So there can be some problems with, with that kind of research. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's certainly interesting and there's certainly, that I, I agree, that could be a good theory as to understanding why uh, rates may differ across countries. Um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't say definitively, but it's a, it's a good idea. <laughs> Right, I'll, I'll, I'll look, I'll, I'll see what I can find on that and stick something in the in the show notes. So I'd like to kind of finish up with moving on to the, the most important part with, you know, what do we do about it? So different treatment options. From my reading of it, we kind of get medication out of the way. So medication's not the best idea, I believe, for social anxiety, or have I, have I got that wrong? <laughs> well, um, The NICE guidelines, so NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. They've developed a number of guidelines for physical and mental health problems, and they've developed some for social anxiety. So I'll I'll go from that because they basically look at all of the research that's available on a range of treatments, and they make guidelines based on the research that, that is available. So, you know, they're basically recommending evidence based treatments um, for a range of different problems. And for social anxiety, they recommend that um, cognitive behavioural therapy is offered as a first line treatment for social anxiety disorder. That if somebody doesn't wish to have cognitive behavioural therapy, then next they should be offered supportive self, supported self help. Um, and that if people decline cognitive behavioural therapy, but then express a preference for medication, then that should first be discussed with them to see what their barriers for thinking, considering and talking treatment might be. But then if they still wish to proceed with medication, then they could be offered um, something like an an SSRI, uh, like escitalopram or sertraline. But what you're right, what is recommended as a first line treatment based on the research is cognitive behavioural therapy. And that's really based on um, a number of trials that have been done um, over the years, um, both in the UK and a number of other countries, showing that um, certain types of very specialised cognitive behavioural therapy that have been sort of designed to particularly with people with social anxiety in mind, can be very effective. So, for example, in one of the research trials that was carried out in this country, about 84% of people who were treated lost their diagnosis of social anxiety after having cognitive therapy. Um, And, you know, and a number of other people that didn't completely lose their diagnosis still got worthwhile benefit from the treatment. So, you know, what we're really seeing is sort of the majority of people that are having this treatment getting a lot of benefit from it. And so really that's why um, that the, the sort of talking therapies like cognitive behavioural therapy that are very specialised for social anxiety disorder are recommended first and foremost. Just before we get into the, the, the CBT side of it, so 84% of people are getting better with CBT. Do we know what the, the figure would be for people just using medication in isolation? Like how effective that is? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that off the top of my head, actually. Um, I know that when cognitive therapy was compared to um, an SSRI, um, cognitive therapy was found to be superior in into uh, treating social anxiety than an SSRI. But actually, I can't remember the the kind of percentage off the top of my head actually of people who who lost their diagnosis following an SSRI. I could look it up and let you know later if that helps. Right, so don't you worry about that. That's that's my job to, to gather all the, the show notes and stuff together. So if you could, could you just kind of explain what somebody could come to expect, the kind of techniques, exercises that might be helpful for somebody with social anxiety? If they were coming for individual treatment, do you mean, Danny? Uh, what, why? What are the what are the alternatives? Uh, well, I mean, there there are a couple of alternatives. Like I mentioned, somebody might get sort of supported self help or um, internet based treatment is something else that we're developing at the moment. But I'll, I'll start by talking about the standard face to face treatment. Okay. Just, is that okay with you? Yeah. So um, typically speaking, um, you'd be hoping to have, I would say, at least ten sessions of weekly therapy and and we often recommend um, some of those sessions being a little bit longer so about 90 minutes 
to enable you to kind of get the most from it, um, that that would start by developing a very sort of individualized version um, of the cognitive model. So, you know, your your therapist would be sitting with you and looking at a recent situation um, that you've been um, anxious in and mapping out with you the different thoughts and feelings and uh, sort of behaviors, really, that um, you, you were sort of experiencing in that situation to really help you understand how the model applies to you. And then treatment really is very hands-on and, and practical. So it's very much done at a per, the person's pace, you know, very collaboratively with the therapist. So the therapist and the patient, the idea is very much you're working together to figure out the problem. And the idea is that we're using lots of experiential exercises. So this isn't just a talking therapy you're not just sitting and having a chat it's a getting up and doing therapy and finding out together therapy if that makes sense um so we do what we call um again at the person's pace lots of behavioral experiments um, and that sounds quite scary but what that actually means is really kind of testing your social fears out at, at your own pace in social situations to really dis to discover when you're doing it differently for example when you're not using some of your uh, the, some of the sort of safety behaviors and and, str and strategies that you've been using and you're focusing a bit more out of your head what actually happens and how do you actually come across and we use things like um, video feedback I think I mentioned that earlier where people have the opportunity to actually see how they come across socially and compare that to how they think they look in their head. Um, and also we can give people sort of still images and things like that to kind of take away on their phone of how they actually come across. So, for example, a lady I was working with recently had a very uh, negative image of herself as looking beetroot red in the face um, and we did some video feedback um, of her, um, she was able to look at a video of herself speaking socially and have some sort of images, uh, still images of herself when she felt she looked beetroot red. Actually, we couldn't really notice her blush at all on the camera. And the other people that she'd been speaking to didn't notice the blush either. And this was incredibly powerful for her to overcome her fear of blushing. So in addition to the, these sort of very hands-on exercises, we also often work on people's memories, their early socially, social trauma memories that I mentioned previously, and help really put those in the past. So again, they're not intruding on the present, a bit like a ghost in the past. They're not haunting you anymore. And you can sort of move forward, really, with your life. So it's a real range of interventions, but really treatment can be incredibly effective at freeing people really it helps people get out of their head we do also do things like attention training so we're helping people move their attention from being very internally focused to being much more lost in the outside world focused on the social situation so ultimately really what people are doing by the end of treatment is they're not focusing on themselves they're getting lost in the conversation they're being themselves and they're able to discover that actually when they are being themselves other people find them completely acceptable as they are you see I, I can i can definitely see the value in that in in a very proactive approach in cbt because that's the that's the idea of uh, this concept of giving your brain um proof and not promises so instead mm -hmm. of just you know when you just kind of sit down and and try and combat your cognitive distortions that's one thing to try and convince yourself of it but like you say with video feedback to actually see to actually get the evidence, the visual evidence that you don't actually come across as bad as you think. I totally understand how that works. What I'm a bit skeptical of it then, especially in this context, is this, is the idea of internet delivered CBT. So could you, cause I know, I know you guys have, uh, have studied that down at Oxford and I'm wondering, I'm going to guess, cause I haven't actually read the studies on it. I'm going to guess that it's not that effective. So okay. I'd, be, I'd, I'd like it if you could prove me wrong. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I think we all have our own assumptions about internet delivered therapy. Um, I had some of my own before going into this treatment trial, but we spent a lot of time developing an online version of our treatment that essentially delivers all of the ingredients I, I just described to you, but through uh, the internet. So um, in our online program, 
patients can work through a number of of modules um, that are very uh, specific to their concerns. So, for example, if uh, if somebody had a fear of blushing, we have a module particularly on a fear of blushing. We have a module if somebody had a fear of sweating, um, they would get that module. If somebody had a fear of being boring, they would get that module. So it's very much tailored to the person's individual fears. They can develop their own model with the help and support of their therapist. So everybody who goes through online therapy has a online therapist. So I was one of the online therapists in our trial. And you get weekly telephone calls and uh, very regular messages to and from your therapist. So rather than sort of like weekly therapy where you're coming in once a week, we see it a bit more like a daily therapy. So people are putting in a bit of time each day and they're having a kind of ongoing interaction with their therapist across the week. Um, so there's lots of benefits there and patients really loved that part of it, actually. Um, well, sorry, I, th I think that's quite an interesting distinction to make. And I think you should probably change the name of internet delivered cognitive therapy to kind of maybe guided internet delivered cognitive therapy, because again, I didn't know that you got support from a therapist. I was kind of picturing that uh, you, uh, you get sent a link to a website and just sort of, you know, flip your laptop open and, and start doing a few, start clicking yeah. a few buttons. So yeah, I didn't know it was supported. Yeah, it is. And, and we think that's very key, actually, that um, there are a number of internet treatments that haven't been so effective because they haven't involved that kind of support from the therapist. We do think that's very important. Um, and also the website is, is very clever. So people, for example, can still do video feedback through the website. So we have a, a Skype based function built into it where you can have conversations like you and I are now with your therapist and, and with other people that we could bring in to talk to you as for a behavioral experiment, for example. And then you could actually record that conversation and watch it back to see how, how it went and whether you came across as negatively as you thought you did or uh, as and, and compare how you looked to your internal image of yourself. We also have in there um, a virtual audience function so people can give presentations for example to a virtual audience they can practice doing that and then record their presentations and watch those back as well. So it's quite a clever program, it's quite interactive. And there are lots of videos on the program. So we have not only videos that our wonderful patients from the past have, have done and, and included their own testimonies of their own experiences, but also videos that we've acted out how to do certain things. Um, so people can watch something and then go and try it themselves. Um, but also um, things like we have an attention training gym. So there's lots of videos on there to help you train your attention to be much more externally focused. So it's, it's a real kind of big package, really. It's it, everything we would do face to face. But basically, you're doing it at your own time in your own space. And that has lots of advantages for people who have busy lives. For example, people who, who are working and might struggle to get out of work to come to weekly sessions. Um, and we found that people put in a lot of time to it actually. So in our trial, people were putting, I think it was between 30 and 40 hours into their into their treatment online over a number of weeks. Um, and at whatever time they wanted, they could do it at sort of Sunday afternoon or two in the morning if they wanted to, which unfortunately your therapist, you know, isn't always available to offer an appointment on Sunday morning at, or two o'clock in the morning if you wanted it. So it has some advantages in that respect. And interestingly, um, in our um, treatment trial, we compared face-to-face -face therapy with internet therapy and the internet therapy did just as well. Oh, it did? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, th there you go then. So that's my, yeah, my little <laughs> hypothesis disproved. Oh, that's, that's probably an important point is the, the, the internet therapy, is that publicly available? It, again, is, is that something people can get through that, the IAT website? Yeah, so it will be. Um, it isn't right at the moment. So we're going to be disseminating it um, into the NHS next year. And so a number of um, uh, improving access to psychological therapy sites are going to be taking part. Um, I'm not 100% sure which services are yet, so I won't be able to tell you that. But I'm sure that we will be having information about that on our website next year. So if people are interested, do do pop and have a look at the, the website and, and check out because I'm sure there'll be some information about which services are taking part in that um, and how people can get access to trying that out if they'd like to. Yeah, but perfect. it's definitely something that we're hoping will roll out more widely to the NHS, um, you know, as, as soon as we can get that up and running. Okay, cool. Sounds good. If you don't mind, I'd like to keep you for a few more minutes to answer some philosophical 
style questions, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Do, um, I'll do my best. <laughs> I've, I've, I, in fact, I'd like to just add a little extra one on, and I've got to ask, because you study this stuff, you know all the tricks of the trade and, and, and all the, the cognitive behavioural exercises, are you, like, super confident in a, in a social sense now? Because... <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I still, um, I, you know, as, as many people do, I still feel a huge amount of anxiety whenever I'm presenting uh, information at conferences and, and things like that. You know, again, anxiety is part of being human and, and none of us can completely escape it. We all kind of have concerns about what other people think of us. That's inevitable. And and I think it would be, I, I think it, you'd be very hard pushed to meet any human being that didn't experience some anxiety in, in those situations. I, I think definitely working with social anxiety has helped me overcome a lot of my own social anxiety. Um, but again, I think I don't think you'll ever find a human being that doesn't feel anxious in some social situations. That That is part of being human. Right, okay. Um, have you got any um, book recommendations on this topic for people? Sort of self-help books, do you mean, Danny? Yeah, or just any anything that you, any book that you feel is relevant that could be of interest to people. Yeah, um, the main self-help book that I recommend is the Gillian Butler Overcoming Shyness and Social Anxiety book um that's normally pretty cheap i think on on amazon so you can you can get that one quite easily that's normally the main um self-help book i recommend okay if you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked however niche however bizarre what would it be and why <laughs> um it's a tricky question, isn't it? Um, I'd be quite interested. Virtual reality is a bit of a developing area, and um, I think it, that would be quite interesting. I think it's quite an expensive thing to do, so that that might be quite good if I had unlimited funding to look at kind of how virtual reality could be used to help people with social anxiety. You know, for example, overcoming sort of presentation anxiety and things like that. So, yeah, I might give that a go. I think if you were willing to give me <laughs> an unlimited pot, pot of money. <laughs> If um, if you could kind of take over the Department of Health for a day and mm. force a policy through to okay. help the help the, the the mental well-being of the general public, have you got any ideas what what policy you might implement? Well, it's interesting because this is something that David Clark, um, who I work with, is you know does regularly. He's constantly talking to the government, and he, along with Richard Layard. Um, have been responsible for the Improving Access to like Psychological Therapies initiative coming in, which is basically where um, a number of years ago they uh, got the government to fund uh, training a huge number of, of psychological therapists and ensuring the provision of um, evidence-based psychological therapies across England um, free through the NHS. And um, actually, if people are interested in that, David um, Clark and Richard Laird wrote a book called uh, Thrive, the Power of Psychological Therapy that people might be quite interested in. Um, but I think I'd, I'd essentially, um, I'd, I'd encourage the ongoing funding of that because, you know, the, the prevalence of mental health problems in the UK and around the world is really immense. Um, and the provision for psychological therapy compared to the prevalence is, is really minimal. You know, we're doing a great job of getting evidence-based treatments out there but we're still not doing the best job we can uh, because there are so many people suffering who haven't had access to the sorts of therapies they need. So I think I'd really just focus on encouraging the government to keep funding, um, improving access to evidence-based psychological therapies across England and wider than England into uh, Scotland, Wales, and, you know, generally speaking, I think across the world, if we can, helping developing countries as well to improve their provision for mental health in general okay uh, going a bit deeper now uh what's the best piece of life advice anybody's ever given you <laughs> um <laughs> i think i think just something i've learned from my patients that i've treated over the years is to be yourself ultimately um so often we're desperately trying to please other people or live up to kind of imagined standards that we think people have set for us um but I think the more we can just be ourselves with all of our human faults and flaws, um, the more we realise how acceptable we are. 
Um, and I think that's something I've learned from all the wonderful people that I've had the pleasure of working with with social anxiety over the years. And it's it's so wonderful when people come to that realization that I think that's probably the best piece of advice that I could have for myself or anyone else. Okay, that's a good one. What part of your career are you most proud of? Um, I think probably ultimately the work that I've I've done with patients. As much as I'm proud of all the research um, that I've done, it, it's the one-to-one work with people and, and just seeing people's lives change that is so moving for me. Um, I've recently been working, uh, doing a sort of small case series, working with a small group of people who are highly self-critical with social anxiety, trying to kind of improve the way we um, target self-criticism in, in the treatment, because I think it's such a, a big problem for so many people. Um, and I'm really proud of, of the work that I've done together with those patients to kind of come up with creative ways to sort of um, try and target self-criticism in, in the treatment. So I'm really proud of that, I think. Okay. Final two. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfillment? (laughs) Travelling, I would say. Um, Travelling the world and meeting different people throughout the world. Um, Those experiences taught me to be much braver and much more courageous in my life, I think. Um, I would say, you know, as as a young person, as I mentioned before, I was quite socially anxious myself. And for example, I never would have sat in a restaurant or a bar on my own in my early 20s. And going traveling, I think, really taught me to be much more independent and much more courageous than than I had been previously. And also, I met so many wonderful people and learned so much from my travels that I always encourage people to travel. I think it's a wonderful thing to do if you can. Right, okay. Uh, Last but not least, what do you think is the key to happiness? Um, it's a very big question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I should have listened to what other people said before I answered this, shouldn't I? Um, I think unhappiness tends to be fueled by negative thinking, by being very stuck in our head, as we mentioned before, by being stuck in the past or stuck in the future. And I think probably the key to a lot of happiness is being in the moment, being lost in doing something that you love doing, whether that's being with your family or being with a pet that you love, or watching a film, but just being fully absorbed in it as much as possible. And in doing that, again, being yourself, you know, um, accepting you are a human being, and that all human beings will fall over, will mess up their words, will get things wrong, will, you know, that is part of being human. We are all fallible. And the more we kind of embrace and accept our human fallible side, I think the happier we will be, in my opinion. So I think it's about being in the moment, but being yourself and being your human self and accepting, accepting that side of you, because, you know, that's the one thing you will always be. (laughs) Yeah, I like it. Well, just so you know, that was a different answer to what anybody else has given so far. So Emma, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Is there anywhere you'd like the, the listeners to visit? Any websites? Are you on social media? Anything like that? Oh, gosh, I wouldn't even be able to remember the addresses um, off the top of my head, but I can I can certainly um, send you them later. I've, look, I can send you our Oxcad app website, the link to that, Danny, if that would help, yep. um, that people can look at that and, and they can see in, in more information about some of the research that we've done there, for example. I don't have my, I don't have my own website or anything like that. I'm, I'm not that snazzy. <laughs> not on Twitter. Oh gosh, you know, I I I have a Twitter account, but I'm I rarely use it. But um, right. yeah, so people are very welcome to follow me. Um, they'll probably see like the occasional tweet every few months. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, that'll that's that's good enough. It's my Twitter anxiety. I need to get over it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm. It. Thank you very much. Wonderful. It's lovely to meet you, Danny. You good too. Luck, uh, good luck with all the podcasts. I'm sure they'll do very well. All right. Thank you. Bye yeah, bye. Enough. Bye. As always, if you'd like to comment on this episode, you can do so at myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find all the show notes and links to any relevant information. If you'd like to contact me, I'm Danny D. Whittaker with two T's on all the various social medias. If you'd like to send me an email, you can do so at danny at myownworstenemy.org. 
If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by sharing links to your favorite episodes with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. And also, you can subscribe via iTunes, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Just search for My Own Worst Enemy. So, as always, until we meet again, behave yourselves, but not too much. And I'll see you again next time. <laughs>